Good afternoon and a warm welcome to this Mr. Geopolitics webinar on how climate security risks shape international cooperation. My name is Björn Ola Linnér and I'm the program director for the Mr. Geopolitics Research Program. It's my pleasure to give a short introduction to the seminar. We have next slide, please. For the first panel, I'm very glad to introduce our qualified uh, Okay, I'll hear my an echo <laughs> with my. Do I hear the recording? Sorry, I could just ask the organizers because I hear myself with a twenty seconds delay. Sorry about that. Well, okay. So for the first, I would like to introduce our qualified panel who have made an important and novel contribution to our understanding of the linkages between climate security and its consequences for international cooperation. We have uh, Dr. Nina von Uxkull. She's a senior lecturer in international relations at Stockholm University. She has uh, several prominent publications on the impacts of climate change, natural hazards and climate policies on armed conflicts and human security. Dr. Lisa Delmuth is an associate professor of international relations also at Stockholm University. She has made significant research contribution on, among others, economic inequality, legitimacy in global climate governance. And finally, we have Maria Yarnes. She is a PhD candidate at uh, Environmental Change at Linköping University and one of the participants at, in the Mistra Geopolitics Research School. In December, she will uh, defend her dissertation with a very topical title for today's seminar, Governing Climate Change Under the Paris Regime, Political Implications of Meeting Urgency with Voluntarism. The seminar will be moderated by Dr. Robert Egnell, who is Vice Chancellor of the Swedish Defense University, but she also is the Professor of Leadership within Within the Mr. Geopolitics uh, Research Program, we are very lucky to have Dr. Gnell on our board, and we are very glad that you could join us for this important seminar. Next slide, please. Uh, we have some house rules. Uh, first, post your questions using the Q&A function on the right hand side, the chat box with a question mark. That way our moderators, which you see on the picture here, will uh, help us to get the questions. Uh, we will also record this meeting and the recording will be available on the Mr. Geopolitics website, which is the address you can find there or you can Google it after the seminar. Next slide, slide please. So before we start, just a few words on the Mr. Geopolitics research program which examines the dynamics between sustainable development and a changing geopolitics uh, to explore new risks, but also new opportunities that arise. Next slide, please. We focus on the interaction between peace and security. Oh, uh, sorry, next slide, please. Go directly there. We focus on the interaction between uh, peace and security, human security, global environment change and global governance. We do this uh, by focusing on three transformative processes. Uh, the transformative potential in the 2030 agenda, the uh, rapid global environment to change, and the new and emerging technologies that also shape the geopolitical landscape, but also the prospects for sustainable development. We focus on four research themes, geopolitics of decarbonization, geopolitics of food security, uh, the politics of sustainable oceans and uh, force capabilities and new emerging technologies. And the, the latter point is particularly important. Our tagline for the program is enhance foresight capacity. And we hope that today's seminar will help to contribute with that. With that, I would like to leave the word over to Professor Gnell. And again, warm welcome. Thank you, Björn Ola, uh, and what an honor it is to be play a small part in the Mistra Geopolitics program on the board. And what a delight it is to be able to take part in this really important conversation uh, 
where we'll have some cutting edge research from from uh, all of you scholars who have provided uh, the data that underlies this conversation. I'd say uh, this has been on the agenda for quite a number of years now, uh, the relationship or the potential relationship between conflict and climate change, but it has been little more than speculation or hypothesization in all kinds of different directions with very limited research underlying this debate. And this Mistra Geopolitics program and, and these specific research projects that we are to hear about today is therefore of, of absolute greatest importance to, to influence and inform this debate that we are facing. Let me also put this a little bit in context because I think many of us followed Biden's leadership uh, climate summit uh, last week and apart from presenting a rather uh, well-developed uh, and, and specific US agenda in relation to climate change uh, to which we can say welcome back the United States to, uh, to a debate in which many other countries have been part for many years obviously uh, but President Biden's director of national intelligence Avril Haines also said uh, to to the world leaders that climate change is no longer a peripheral issue but at the very center of US foreign policy. Um, the question then is what does that mean when it comes from, from the director of national intelligence? How will that influence US foreign policy and, and what, what types of consequences are we likely to see? That is for the future to show. Um, but whatever the consequences, what we do know is cutting edge research that informs this debate. So I'm so delighted uh, to be able to introduce these different research projects that we will hear more about in the in the coming hour. And first of all, it's Nina von Uxkull. Uh, you're very welcome and uh, please start. Thank you so much, Robert, for the, the kind introduction to Bjorn Ole as well. So uh, my research uh, in the past 10 years actually has, has focused on uh, getting getting this knowledge together and really really identifying where and under what circumstances does climate change matter uh, for armed conflict. And this research field uh, as such is, is still really a young research field and getting to these answers that policy needs right now. So how much does it matter? Where does it matter? Is, is really not not simple. And the first um, paper I would like to, to briefly present, uh, if we move to the next slide, is a, a process that has been going on. If we move to the next slide, you see, you, you should see, yes, you should see the, uh, in the output uh, of a, a paper that was published, published in 2019 of a process that was led and guided by Catherine Mach that I was part of bringing together experts from different fields with different views on the topic and really kind of asking you as experts what are what is the kind of the general assessment about the importance of climate change for conflict right now but also in the future. And what you see here is the ranking um, provided by these uh, 11 uh, researchers in the field about what is most important for conflict right now and and what you see is that climate variability and change is not is not really coming up uh, or coming coming up on this list rather kind of further down so it's really uh, what we can can con conclude and that this is also substantiated by by, by many studies is not that climate uh, that societies uh, deal with floods and droughts and storms and other manifestations of climate change necessarily in a, in a violent way, but mostly it's a kind of a peaceful response to these issues. That said, uh, research and uh, has started identifying structural risk factors that make areas indeed being at risk uh, of seeing um, climate uh, leading into or perpetuating conflict, making conflict more severe. And if we move to the next slide, this allows us to, um, to identify reasons at risk. And one of the attempts to, to do so and communicate that uh, was an effort from 2018, a paper with Joshua Bosby, where we kind of tried to map out some of these risk factors. And some of them where I think we know enough to say these are really regions or these are really factors that, that matter 
or uh, ongoing conflict are that the population is dependent on agriculture of agriculture income that is in turn sensitive to the climate and discriminatory political institution. And if we map on this on the on the world map that these are some of the countries uh, at risk that you see here in yellow and, and red and we can use that and together with climate data with data on water insecurity to identify potential reasons at uh, regions at risk that should be monitored and where interventions potentially should be focused. Um, if we move on to the next slide. Um, I started off by saying climate change is not very important in current societies. Um, going back to the expert assessment, when when we consider the future and the consider consider the future of a potential two degrees or four degrees warming, uh, this is disastrous climate change that we haven't really experienced. So, while we have just concluded the warmest decade on records. This disastrous climate change is, is something that that will just amplify a lot of the, the magnitude of, of the impacts. So um, when we again move to a systematic assessment of what this may mean for conflict, you see here um, that overall assessment is uh, the, the yellow and, and red dots across expert is that risk may also increase, although uncertainty also increases as well. So how much uh, how much does this increase? Uh, if we move on to the next slide, this is a very difficult question. If we if we get to or if we consider the the climate change and climate change impact literature as such, uh, climate science have been much better at providing projections and trajectories of, of future developments than compared to to social scientists and conflict scientists in, in particular. What we do know, though is that um, conflict is is right now a risk factor of making societies particularly vulnerable and is also uh, a risk factor that that will have implications for how societies are able to deal with climate change and where potential risk may lay in the future so what you see here is a slide of a study by Hova, uh, by a study a study by Hovart Hege and Kristina Petrova among, among others who are based at Osara University who looked into conflict and what conflict means for future economic development um, and looking into projections of economic development that are widely used in climate change impact assessments. And what they do find is once we take into account conflict in regions that are conflict at conflict risk today, but also maybe at risk in the future, this really depresses the, the, the future, future growth and the projections that a lot of the research is relying on right now are too optimistic. So in the slide you see East Africa, this is an example where across different scenarios of population growth and education, for example, uh, we will see depressed growth um, once we take into account that some of these uh, countries are in, are in conflict. So this points to, and we move to the next slide, this points to the importance to also consider uh, conflict interlinkages with other factors. And this is something that also some research from uh, from Mr. Geopolitics in the past years um, has been looking into. What you see here is in a matrix of the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goals, one of them, SDG 16, being on, on just and peaceful societies. And what this really shows that uh, conflict or the lack of conflict goes together with a number of important uh, outcomes, a number of uh, SDGs and overall the SDG agenda is characterized by synergy. So if we address conflict, this is fully compatible, but will also likely have a lot of other uh, add on factors, uh, add on impact on uh, on other factors. So we really need to consider conflict interlinked also uh, with other outcomes. And I'm really happy that uh, in Mr. Geopolitics, we now both study decarbonization, but also food security and, and other factors to look more into these interlinkages. So to conclude, I move to the last slide. Um, we do in current societies not see that climate change is a huge, important driver of armed conflict. We do see it seems to constitute an additional risk add on risk in areas that are in conflict, uh, have seen recent conflict that are dependent on agricultural production as a sector that are characterized by discriminatory institutions. But as we move on to potential scenarios of two degrees warming, four degrees warming, um, these risks may quite likely amplify. <laughs>
And lastly, importantly, um, conflict is also a major driver of vulnerability and connected in multiple ways with SDGs and with other sustainable development goals, pointing to the importance to uh, further study the interconnected um, issues in, in this field and also feedback loops from conflict um, to other factors and back to conflict. Thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you for an excellent presentation, Nina, and, and that really provides food for thought in terms of not drawing simplistic conclusions about the linkages here. We are so instead we, we have to view conflict uh, or climate change as one factor amongst many others that interplay in societal changes that might have different sort of uh, political consequences. Um, next, I would like to move on to uh, Lisa Delmuth, uh, who will present her research. You're most welcome. Thank you so much, Robert, and thanks, Nina, for a great presentation. I will take up some of the issues that you talked about, for example, about the issue linkages. Um, my research over the past 10 years, basically, has focused on global governance and then Mr. Geopolitics. Um, I have over the past five years or so engaged with the issue of climate security. And I can say this is a really exciting, lively uh, area of research, but also a moving target, which does make things easier. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so what we, in terms of uh, that it's a moving target, I think in the past decades, uh, we can say local and national governments have realized that they cannot adequately address climate risks on their own. Um, and this insight is now widespread and it has helped bring increasing attention to adaptation and mitigation in international climate negotiations. Um, I think when we speak about climate change governance in terms of adaptation and mitigation broadly, of which climate security is one aspect, uh, we can say that those issues have historically been dealt with uh, in, in global governance in conjunction by uh, uh, international governmental organizations that have mandates in climate change, but also uh, in development, uh, such as the UNFCCC or the UNDP. Um, climate as a risk for human security and national security has in the past 15 years or so increasingly been addressed by uh, intergovernmental organizations with core mandates in other areas, in areas other than development and environmental affairs. Uh, relatedly, this figure you see here shows the yearly number of adaptation related activities of 30 major uh, intergovernmental organizations, including the UNDP, UNFCCC, Security Council, but also a number of regional organizations such as the Pacific Island Forum, the African Union or the European Union, uh, which um, um, Iyad Shadikaral has in her PhD dissertation coded on the basis of official documents, mainly international organization annual reports. Next slide. In this broader climate governance landscape, um, we can see an emerging global climate security regime. Um, although the relevance of these intergovernmental organizations for resolving climate security challenges, um, and although this relevance is increasingly being acknowledged in policy making communities across local, uh, subnational, national and global levels, Research on climate security governance is still not widely perceived as a research field on its own right. Um, to give an overview of the of the state of the art, the knowledge, the scientific knowledge we have in climate security governance, we have in a recent study categorized existing studies in terms of their main conceptual and empirical foci. Um, and we have published the study in 2018 in the wise climate change. Um, it's called IGOs and climate security. Um, and we observe three such foci, um, the IGOs, intergovernmental organizations, policy areas and um, specific security notions or understandings. And one of the main finding and insight of this study was that research on climate security uh, and thereby also knowledge is siloed in these three different areas. Just to give you a brief example, there's a lively debate about climate security in the EU that underlines the EU's norm entrepreneurship on the issue that focuses uh, on uh, how the EU links uh, climate security to uh, to other issue areas such as health or energy. Um, but these studies rarely communicate with other literatures, for example, international relations research in the UN. Although 
there is increasingly integrated governance and climate security. This is also one of the main findings that comes out of the, the, the phase, Mr. Geopolitics phase one research is that um, there is a lot of integrated governance nowadays and there's increasing insight that we need more integrated governance, integrating climate security into in different issue areas. Um, a case in point um, is the Environment and Security Initiative, ENVISEC initiative that you might be familiar with. Uh, this is a partnership including traditional security organizations such as NATO, but also organizations focusing on human security such as UN, U, UNDP or UN Environment. Um, and it seeks to address conflict risks caused by environmental change in different crisis regions with varying foci. Next slide, please. Um, so um, what we have been interested in is to dig a bit deeper into how this international organization engagement with climate security um, looks like. Um, and um, what we have done is to do an encompassing document and interview study, including uh, interviews among um, uh, climate scientists and social scientists working on, on climate change and IGOs, but also um, interviews with policymakers. Um, and what we what we have found um, is basically, uh, as you can see here in, in this figure, um, is that there is um, that the, that the material um, gives information about different categories of engagement, ranging from rhetorical uh, devices like declarations and statements to more operational aspects um, like uh, funding or institution buildings or specific projects, projects and programs. Um, and as you can also see is that over, if you compare these two time periods, uh, a rhetorical um, engagement with climate security clearly abounds and has become more emphasized over time, um, whereas the operational work has uh, in, in, in relation to the other categories um, uh, not increased, but rather decreased. Next slide, please. Um, let's see. Uh, then, um, let me see if I can see you here. Yes, no. Uh, then we were also interested in, um, in digging deeper into um, how the IGOs conceive of climate security risks. And I think that um, Maria will later on um, tell you more about this issue. Um, but what we asked um, our experts uh, is to rate these IGOs in terms of their understanding of human versus na uh, uh, national security um, uh, understandings of climate security risks on a scale from zero to 10, where zero was human security understanding and 10 was um, national security understanding. And you can see here that the boxes are the are 50% uh, around the medium uh, on, on, on median value on the scale. Uh, and these tails are at 25% of the data distribution on the right and the left hand side respectively. So what this shows you is that interestingly, human security understandings um, in global governance, not only in the UN system, but also outside and also in classic security organizations uh, like OSSE or uh, the UN uh, Security Council, the human security understanding uh, is most emphasized. Next slide, please. Um, we have then also focused, started to focus in our group on uh, the framing of the problem of climate security risks. And we have done so by looking at uh, social media, especially Twitter uh, data that is frequently used by policymakers, as you know, um, and the multilaterals also use uh, Twitter for communication. So we have studied eight UN agencies, uh, among others, Security Council and FAO, and have um, looked at their communication about climate security issues in different issue areas. Uh, and what you see here um, is an interesting word cloud of the data overall that shows you uh, which words uh, are used most prominently. But we have also looked at different issue areas, for example, climate induced displacement, climate related health and food security uh, and how um, uh, how climate security um, problems or challenges are 
uh, framed within these areas. And using inductive methods, we found that three type of framings are predominant. Emergency framings, emotional framings, and technical, technical framings. Um, among these UN agencies, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, technical framings abound. Uh, and interestingly, they're also more likely to spur diffusion of framings or problem understandings among the UN agencies. Um, however, emotional frames are more common in some issue areas, such as food security, uh, an issue that we will dig in deeper uh, in Mr. Geopolitics phase two, which I'm very happy about. Um, and but, but also interestingly is that emotional frames among the UN agencies do not necessarily promote the diffusion of specific frames uh, or problem definitions, but it's rather the technical framings that stand out in this regard. Next slide, please. Uh, in sum, what our research uh, in phase one on this topic has shown is that a growing number of multilateral institutions across policy domains, also in non-climate and non-development areas, has governed climate risks since about 2007. Discursive actions are most common uh, and a human security understanding of climate risks uh, dominates in global governance. This variation in governance indicates a a certain degree of fragmentation. Um, I talked about uh, the, the, the silos and knowledge uh, that we still uh, have to tackle and overcome. Um, and there are multiple drivers um, uh, of this fragmentation that are varying between different contexts. So uh, in phase two, we will um, hopefully gain a better understanding of how to overcome existing fragmentation and promote more integrated governance for better problem solving. But there are, of course, no simple or blueprint measures to reduce conflict oriented fragmentation. Um, or fragmentation with unintended consequences. Um, so what kind of uh, future we look at uh, remains a matter of discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. And, and I guess it's rather promising to hear that international organizations are certainly on top of this issue, uh, uh, but then again, uh, working with it in very different ways and, and perhaps then talking more and more and publishing more and more reports rather than, than dealing with, with, with the effects of it. Um, on, on, on this framing issue, uh, I would uh, like to introduce our final speaker, uh, Maria Janes, uh, who is presenting a report she, she is uh, publishing together with Bjorn Ola. So you're most welcome, Maria. Thank you, Robert. Um, yes, so this is a study that Bino Lalagé and I are working on, um, which is about perceptions of climate security risks among participants at UN climate conferences, the COPs. Uh, so here I'm going to highlight some of the findings from this study. Can I have next slide, please? So we start this study from this increased linking of climate change to different aspects of security that we have heard the previous speakers mention and also the debate about opportunities and drawbacks of such uh, climate securitization, as it's usually called in, in uh, literature. So in this study, we have surveyed three UN climate conferences from 2017 to 2019, with a total of about 2,700 respondents that represent states, businesses, and civil society. And we asked, if and how respondents perceive of climate change in terms of security risks. And we were also interested in cross-country and cross-actor group patterns among respondents. So we compared survey responses to different indices, including countries' income levels, human development index, whether the country has experienced territorial conflict the last 10 years, and ND gain, which is an index that assesses countries' readiness and vulnerability to uh, climate risks. Can I have the next slide, please? So overall, respondents to a high degree perceive of climate change in terms of security risk, both to peace and security internationally, human security globally, and to peace and security and human security in their own country of residence. And in the table here, we also see that respondents perceive of climate change in terms of different aspects of security, including displacement, resources such as food, water and energy, and stability and violent conflict. And we see that all aspects are ranked very high um, in their, both in their median and the mean, but we also see that trade ranks slightly lower than the other security aspects. 
So in the following, I'll present uh, some more of the results, and these are the statistically significant differences that we have found uh, among the groups that we compared. Next slide, please. So regarding climate change as a risk to international peace and security, we see that respondents from richer and less vulnerable countries to a high degree suggest that climate change could present such a risk to international stability. So there's some more heterogeneity among respondents from poorer, more vulnerable countries with a wider spread of responses. And as we will see, the results are reversed when it comes to climate change as a risk to security in one's own country of residence. So what we can see from this is that some respondents seem to perceive of climate change as a risk to international stability and perhaps resource competition, uh, while others seem more concerned about local effects. Next slide, please. So this picture shows cross-national patterns of climate change as a risk to peace and security in one's own country of residence. And here we see a larger spread of responses. Um, but here, respondents from richer and less vulnerable countries clearly perceive of climate change as a lower risk to peace and security in their own countries than respondents from the other groups. But they do still perceive of it as a risk with a median of um, between four and five. Next slide, please. So last, we see the same patterns in respondents' perceptions of climate change as a risk to human security in their countries of residence. And respondents from poorer, more vulnerable countries seem to perceive of climate change as a risk to human security in their own countries. But there is also a slightly larger spread of responses among respondents from richer and less vulnerable countries. We also see a, high, a higher median for state actors than business and civil society actors. And there's also quite a large spread uh, um, of responses from business and civil society actors. So the next slide, please. So the conclusions that we draw from this is that overall, we see that COP participants or UN Climate Conference participants to a high degree perceive of climate change in terms of security risks. And we see that respondents from richer, less vulnerable countries express stronger concern for international peace and security while respondents from poorer, more vulnerable countries are strongly concerned about peace and security and human security in their own countries. So why does this matter? Well, we argue here in this study that it's important to continue following this theme of climate politics as the ways in which climate change is framed, for example, in terms of security, legitimizes different types of actions and responses to climate change. So we also ask here as a some final questions. What is the transformative potential of securitized framings of climate change? Will framing climate change in terms of security catalyze this necessary transformative action, transparency and trust building among actors, or will it contribute to resource competition focusing on preserving national security and perhaps paralyze multilateral cooperation? So with that, I give the word back to you, Robert. Thank you. Th thank you so much for a really interesting presentation. And, and clearly, clearly we are not perceiving this problem in as a mutual problem with the same framework. And, and that is a poor beginning for, for the start of, of dealing with issues. Um, that concludes our presentation part of, of this seminar. And we now move on to more of a, a panel discussion. And I would really encourage all of you at home to also uh, post your questions in, in the chat function. I'll keep an eye on that. Uh, and and uh, while I also have a few questions of my own. Uh, so I'll, I'll, let me start out by saying um, that there's always a risk when we speak both of international security and climate change, that it becomes a very abstract and sort of numbers game kind of approach. Uh, so I, I was wondering if you can sort of walk us through the processes, how, how does this affect people? What, what does this mean for individuals? Because clearly climate change isn't attacking our borders or uh, challenging the integrity of our states. Uh, so so what, why does this matter? How, how are people affected uh, on the ground? Nina, would you like to take a first stab at this? Sure. Uh, thanks a lot, Robert. This is, of course, a very relevant, relevant question. So, I mean, for one, what we see is like how how conflict emerges out of this. These are there are different 
uh, I mean, there are different different ways for how how climate and climate related extremes uh, matter. For example, um, we have um, I, I was speaking about the agricultural sector. We have regions like northern Nigeria with the Boko Haram insurgency, where where people affected by by additional drought in the in the situation of conflict, where we we see this is a huge problem for human security, but where also there are reports where displacement together uh, or resulting from this double exposure to to climate risk and to to conflict leads to displacement people moving moving to other areas where there's conflict emergent in these in these host areas so it's kind of if we look into this into the uh, into the interlinkages and look at this on the ground it's it con continues to be a kind of quite uh, complex or we, we see these uh, interactions playing out in in different ways and in, in complex ways but we do see this um, both kind of a risk in terms of livelihood but in terms of food security but then also uh, in in this in this conflict region potential for 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 feedbacks and for feeding into conflict in other areas so maybe this was a more develop oh, this was a more kind of a, a uh, how does it play out on the ground but maybe maybe um, we can could should also speak about um, what how it matters for Sweden and uh, other populations Absolutely, and, and and I think a question in relation to that is, it's also the fact that you've you've spoken about different kinds of security. There's the international security, and that seems to be the worry for us uh, in 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 the the richer part of the world. But there's also the human security dimension at the individual or group level uh, that is more of a concern than in 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 the developing world, and and. This is quite interesting to me, I and mean, it, it seems to overlap with, with um, quite a lot of issue areas where most problems seems to be a problem for others in, 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 in this sort of um, giving part of the world in, 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 in international aid terms, uh, while we always assume that it's an issue uh, of, of um, that that's the, the recipients should address uh, at home for them, and 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 this is again, I think, a, a potential source of challenges within international organizations. If certain members of the organization see this as a, something they have to solve for others, while others are supposed to take it at heart and deal with themselves. But uh, I was wondering if we could dig deeper into this security concept and and what that actually means. Who's Whose security are we talking about here? Because Avril Haines, Director of National Intelligence, it seems maybe she's talking about US national security here. And I read a Pentagon report quite a number of years ago also highlighting this as a national security issue. But but it, who's, is this about national security or is it individual security? Where should we place our focus? Um, I, I heard that international organizations seems to talk a little bit more about human security than international security. Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, Maria and Bjorn Ola, would you like to, to start perhaps? And yeah, precisely. I think that that's where precisely sort of the, the point of contestation now when we hear more and more talk about climate security. Uh, not the least after the uh, leadership summit on climate change, uh, which Biden invited to last week. So, and of course, how we frame the security concept, we, we is, it's uh, we see large differences there, and I think that that's important, as you point out, to keep in mind when Avril Haines and others uh, talk about the the perceived threat to the US naval bases and so on, that is picked up by environmentalists saying that, oh, this shows how important uh, climate change is and we need to put that on the agenda. And perhaps it's a way to persuade also some Republicans and so on in, in the Senate and, and and some Democrats as well. But of course, uh, that that is a huge difference if that is framed, if climate security is framed in that way, uh, or if we go to the refugees from from to uh, from Tuvalu or other low lying lying low lying island states where where it's more of an ontological security where the, it's an existential threat that is the term that Biden uses but then how it's operationalized or what we what, what measures are invoked i think that's a huge difference there so it's not unproblematic to, to securitize climate change, even though it's perfectly understandable because it definitely it's a crisis. 
Lisa, would you also like to add something on this uh, in terms of the organizational responses, for example? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I think uh, the framing and understandings of climate security are a really important topic. Um, when we look at the literature and what we know about the concept and how it's being addressed and with what effects, I think state security and national security is clearly the primary focus of studies on, well, security, of course, but also mm -hmm. diplomacy, peace and conflict. Um, whereas human security is mostly studied in relation to development, disaster risk reduction and um, migration or climate induced displacement and health uh, also increasingly. Um, so you can see that we have we have knowledge uh, gaps in understanding um, how we can how we best address the problem um, given given the siloed nature of research but also of, of our different discourses and our respective policy communities and I do think I mean uh, if I should speak my own mind I think it it, it, it contributes to problem solving um, that we see that hu human security understanding um, dominates uh, in, in global governance. I mean, if we think of the, the problems on the ground that climate change is, is causing, um, both the developed and the development world are clearly affected. Um, like, for example, but since the 1970s, for example, over 95% of all deaths from, from climate and weather related disasters have occurred in developing countries. And we should not forget that, particularly for these countries, it's a concern um, that uh, uh, that uh, more severe natural hazards increase the risk of displacement, social unrest and conflict. Uh, and Nina's uh, mentioned really good examples. And I think this is the work well, the, well, where, where the work of the multilaterals comes in. For example, OCHA's uh, disaster relief, um, but also how one works preventively with disaster risk reduction and with climate related development issues and, and health issues. Um, and, and ultimately, um, for, for, for me, human security ought to be in the center of the debate, uh, not only to improve problem solving on the ground, but also to reduce the, the gaps um, between the policy communities. Oh, interesting. We, we've, uh, we have a question from Bessie in the chat uh, about this, how we can break the silo mentality on climate governance. Uh, but it seems th that would be one of your suggestions that, that, that the human security concept can sort of break down the traditional barriers between different silos in international organizations. Am I understanding you right, uh, Lisa? That's my hypothesis based on what uh, I know from the field work that we've done and the document studies. And any other thoughts on the on the silo question? How can we tear down the barriers between different policy communities? In, in in global government or climate governance. Nina, I can I yeah. can I can say something. So I think what we we see this silos also partly in 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 research. I mean, there is often when we look, for example, in the research on, on there's the peace building community, right? There's the the the, the mediation community, or the, so these are also kind of partly partly silos. So I think one step that how how we can do it as researcher is I think to increasingly address these in these these interlinkages and and bridge these uh, these these uh, uh, these issue areas ourselves to provide the knowledge knowledge for how also others can or the practitioners and policies can do that. Yes, and, and um, some some advertising them for the, the Mr. Geopolitics program from me then, because that's exactly what it's all about, isn't it? Um, anyway, uh, Bjorn Ola, you, you also talked here about the securitization and, and the potential risks in that when it comes to climate change, because obviously if we see this only as a source of potential uh, international security challenges and, and, and war over resources, then, then there's a risk we tackle it in, uh, in the absolute wrong ways, obviously. But at the same time, within uh, amongst a lot of climate activist groups, and, and not least uh, Fridays for Futures and, and Greta Thunberg, we, we hear the argument that this must be approached as a crisis. And, and it's, it's also been made comparisons between the pandemic, where that is treated very much like a crisis and we, we, we throw enormous energy and resources at it. And, and that climate change then deserves the same type of crisis approach. Um, 
do you think this would be the right approach and, and how, how would this be different from securitization, uh, a crisification, if you will, that uh, climate activists are, are pushing for? That's extremely good analogy, I think, because it's a crisis, definitely, in the terms that it's an extremely difficult to dangerous point uh, in the situation that we are. The responses, though, don't have to be state of emergency or, or even in terms of, of a threat to national security in order for us to prioritize this. So if you think about the response to the pandemic, for instance, that how states are responding and to what extent uh, a state of emergency would in, be invoked can have repercussions, how legitimate the policies will be in the long run and what kind of society we are creating. That's why the, the focus on transform transformation and uh, the, the crisis response then in the EU, for instance, now in the Green Deal is to try to, to see this, how can we transform Europe to, to a more pleasant society, a more healthy society, a greener society. So you can have a crisis response without invoking sort of this more uh, totalitarian way. There is always risk with the language of emergent state of emergency or, or a threat to or war metaphors and so on that we stimulate the thinking of a more uh, a response that is more in a, well in, in a more totalitarian responses or surpassing democratic institutions and so on uh, while if we stimulate the, the imagination and the, the creativity and so on. But of course, we need to still be aware, treat it as a tr crisis. There, I agree with the uh, Fridays for the Futures. The emergency language, though, I, I'm a bit more wary of what that, where that might take us. Would anyone like, else like to chime in on, on this topic? I think that uh, the, the question of whether a crisisification or securitization of climate change really helps problem solving or helps us to to gain a unified and better understanding of climate security risks and their, their problems, that, that's, a, that's a really important topic uh, of discussion. And I, I think we have very little, very little solid scientific knowledge on that issue. Um, I think studies of framing of, of, of climate security risks and what it does to um, the, 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 the improvement of policy re responses in different policy communities in global governance is, I mean, knowledge is very thin. Uh, so we're on thin ice here, but I, I think um, we, should, we should ask ourselves um, whether we're in this crisis and this kind of discourse for the long run, um, uh, or whether we want to, in the short, short run, raise attention for the issue. But I'm also um, hesitant as to whether it's productive to keep up uh, uh, this uh, crisis, crisis laden or security laden discourse um, uh, for for a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm not. Um, I, I think we can only speculate what it does to the debate, but we should critically ask ourselves how how we put things, and that's why I think that the human security concept um, has a lot of promise because uh, it is a concept that is recognized in, in both national security discourse and the the more human oriented and development oriented policy communities. Thank you very much. Um, Someone in relation to this, there's a, um, a question in the chat from Paula Vesco at Uppsala University. Uh, about the emotional framing that Lisa mentioned in, in, in the presentation. Um, do you find any particular connotation, positive or negative, attached to the emotional framing here? Uh, and, and is there any any intuition behind the uh, uh, emotional framing being more prevalent in food security than other parts of human security, I guess, then is, is the question. Yes, we, we, we observe the emotional framing, especially in the areas uh, of food security. Um, and it also we have also found that 
frame the fusion or yes, the fusion of the specific understanding of, of climate security risks in terms of food security um, uh, is actually spurred if, 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 if UN agencies adopt uh, a, a, an emotional um, an emotional tone to um, mm. to the communication. Um, we also find that emotional tonality, so to speak, um, promotes uh, frame diffusion in relation to biodiversity risks, climate disaster risks, and green greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but in other policy areas, um, we find emo emotional framings less prevalent, and um, we sometimes um, uh, Sorry, I should have said that we find we also find negative effects. We find, for example, that emotional framings of greenhouse gas emissions, sorry, of mitigation, um, reduce the likelihood of frame diffusion. So it's not only that uh, the emotionality varies across policy areas, um, but it's also that uh, it varies in terms of effects on, on, on frame diffusion with positive effects on food security, but mm. negative on mitigation, for example. Excellent. Is is these emotional or are these emotional aspects something you find in in your research as well, Maria? Um, when you look at the, uh, the the framing in international organizations, for example, we haven't seen them uh, specifically with the um, emotions. Since this is a survey, so we provided answers to the respondents, which of course limits uh, what we could right. what we could ask. Um, so not specifically uh, about emotions, no. Um, we have a, a rather specific question here on the, on the COPs. Now, now it's it, the, the, the climate uh, co conferences. Um, what exactly does it stand for? Um, help me out here. Um, and how effective they have been in any case? Conference of parties to the oh, UNFCCC. Yes. Thank you. Uh, how effective have the, these been in enhancing climate change governance, uh, would you argue? Well, massive question. Um, yeah. <laughs> good one, though. Um, I think they have been effective um, in terms of spreading the word about climate change, but also, um, as Lisa was talking about, frame diffusion, I think, framing climate change in specific ways, um, framing it as an international uh, issue um, that all states should be interested in dealing with, but also, as we've seen now, uh, after Paris, um, after the Paris Agreement, that it has also, um, the COFs or the UNFCCC have, have put more resources into also engaging uh, non-state actors, such as business or uh, civil society or different types of organizations. So I think that they, they have a real um, important position as, as a hub for, for climate change governance. I think uh, um, a, a sort of geopolitical international security question here from Marlin. Uh, have you seen in your research um, a particular geographical area that could be singled out uh, as a sort of a, a, a bigger geopolitical risk due to climate change? Uh, and if so, uh, is it possible to mitigate the risk by speaking more openly about this? Um, and and Felix, Musonier, Felix Musonier is also asking um, in relation to his area, the Horn of Africa, where we're saying that there's, there's, they're often subjected to cross-border related climate conflicts. Um, do you see any of these trends? We saw the vulnerabilities map so, sort of uh, from Nina there, but are there particular areas of tension globally where you see climate change sort of enhancing risks of international security and discord? Nina, do you want to start perhaps? Yes, this was sure. closest to you, um, I believe. Sure. I mean, uh, the most kind of violent armed conflicts that we see and see today are, are internal ones. When I think about geopolitical crisis and when I think about the uh, the future, one, one area that is often singled out is the Arctic region where we have kind of big shifts. Uh, Horn of Africa is is important too. I think one one of the important issues there is also how how energy is dealt with and the the, the issues of dam and, and energy production that could potentially be something or water uh, water issues that could could potentially be something that are lead to more tensions uh, in, in the future. So um, 
I think there are these are two areas where where I could think also about kind of more geopolit geopolitical mm -hmm. and transboundary transboundary issues uh, emerging. If, if I may add also, Robert, so just I just want to echo what Nina said, especially on the transboundary issues, but something that we have put our attention to in the Mr. Geopolitics program is precisely sort of the transboundary impacts of climate change, not only the impacts in the geographical area where they, they occur, but what this means for trade routes and, and international resource flows. And, and with, with more and more focus on AI as a response to, to climate change and the sustainable development goals, we see an increased competition also in the cyberspace. So it's not only about geographical space here, but mm -hmm. we, we need to have our focus on those areas as well. And I, I, I might add also from a from a sort of conflict research perspective that uh, sometimes it, the issue at hand isn't the issue, but rather the conflict between the actors. So where there is tension and where there is limited governance structures to 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 mitigate those conflicts, whatever reason can be used uh, to pick up arms. Right? And and so then that means where, wherever there is tension and potential conflict, climate change might be the factor that is used uh, to get one's political will through in the international order, so to speak. Uh, so that might be, well, it's a reversed order of effects, I guess, uh, as well. It, it doesn't, it's not necessarily climate change that leads to conflict, but sort of conflict rather using climate change as, a, as an excuse uh, to improve one's position. Um, Final question for you. We're, we're running out of time, but there's some really important lessons to be learned here, and I, I'd like to move closer to home then. What, what can we take away from a Swedish perspective? Uh, what would you hope the Swedish government to take away from your from, from your research? Anyone would like to... Uh, start how can the swedish government use the climate conferences for example which issue should they should they emphasize what kind of language should they promote uh, any thoughts i don't know what they should be doing and my research is in global governance but what we have yeah. observed is is that uh, uh, these uh, these silos of scientific knowledge and of of uh, different languages on climate security and different policy communities is not really is not really helping problem solving. Uh, so I think, if possible, it's 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 surely a good idea to think about how we can bridge policy communities even at the national level uh, in Sweden uh, to bring in uh, uh, thoughts discourse about climate security risks, different types of climate security risks, and what they mean in different issue areas, and how we can engage with them. Thank you. And I, I, I would like to just add that the traditional Swedish role of being a bridge build, I think is particularly important in the light of the, of the, the survey that uh, Maria just presented, where we, we still see this, this tension between the have and the have nots in the world, and those who are affected by climate change and those who are not, and those who are well to do and those who are not. And the, and the Swedish efforts when it comes to our development to cooperation and so on, to not only look at the vulnerable countries, but also the, the as somebody said here, the, the vulnerable regions, the vulnerable groups within the countries. I think it's tremendously important for us to build trust uh, for the future. And of course, also to try to mitigate a, a, a disaster and a terrible situation that we know are coming and that we know will increase through the years to come. Yes. Well, I think uh, what we are facing here is obviously a, a global phenomenon, a global challenge that will require global responses and, and not even the most powerful countries in the world can tackle climate change on their own. And, and even though it seems the richer part of the world now sees this as a problem for others, um, I, I think the, there will be a, a rude awakening when we realize that climate change will affect us all. And, and that it also might have in some ways stronger effects in, in communities that are not at all used to uh, serious vulnerabilities, uh, like Sweden, for example. Um, but um, in connection then with the initial remarks here, uh, Avril Haynes, um, I think your research finds that first of all, uh, 
this is not necessarily an international security. This this is not a, a clear driver of conflict. I think that's one of the key takeaways we had from this seminar. Uh, and that means securitizing this issue might be uh, quite a risk uh, uh, in terms of, of leading away from the actual types of responses that we want to see to this global challenge. Um, my key takeaway is also the fact that uh, um, the Mistra Geopolitics research program is spot on in addressing some of the key knowledge gaps that, that we need to fill in order to respond to these crises in an appropriate way and in all, also in, an, in terms of understanding how international operations do look at these issues and how they can perhaps also improve uh, the way they frame uh, but also tackle these issues. Um, and I think uh, we didn't have much time for it, but there's there's enormous lessons at both the global and the national level in, in, in tackling these issues as well. So I really want to thank uh, all the, the speakers, uh, the researchers who provided this important knowledge, uh, but I also want to thank all of you at home for, for not only listening in, but also contributing in, in a very meaningful way through your, your excellent questions. Uh, thank you all once again, and I hope to see you all uh, in the near future. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.